Hey everyone, welcome back to EMTV. My name is Alex Like, and today I thought I'd introduce a new segment called Paramedic Pathophys. I've designed this segment to provide a quick rundown on the pathophysiology, physical findings, and treatments for common medical conditions or emergencies. Please keep in mind, for the sake of brevity, I'm only sticking to the high points. So sit back, relax, and let's talk about asthma. So asthma is an obstructive pulmonary disease. It affects patients from pediatrics all the way through geriatrics. It's characterized by bronchospasms, bronchoconstriction, and wheezing. And if you think about the physiology behind wheezing, it makes a lot of sense. You're narrowing the airways, and because it's taking longer for the air to exit, it creates pitch. Now generally wheezing is first heard during the expiratory phase, and you'll first hear wheezing usually in the lower lung fields. However, as asthma progresses, you can hear wheezing throughout the entirety of the lungs, and you can even hear it during the inspiratory phase. One of the most ominous findings we can have with an asthmatic patient is to actually have absent lung sounds. This is when no air is able to be exchanged. So don't be concerned when you're treating an asthmatic or if you didn't hear lung sounds before, after a treatment now you hear wheezing. This is actually considered an improvement. What we're looking for here is an increase in aeration, the overall airflow. And with some asthmatics, in addition to the bronchospasm or bronchoconstriction, mucus is produced in these smaller airways, making them even narrower. Most severe asthma events, especially the ones that you were called to treat, are usually preceded by some kind of trigger. Now, depending on the individual, Triggers may involve things like environmental triggers like pollen, chemical triggers like certain kinds of perfumes or other strong odors, for example, allergies, and even exercise or exertion can trigger an asthma event. Though every asthmatic patient that you treat is different, they share common characteristics or presentations. Oftentimes they'll be tachypnic, as in breathing more rapidly than normal. They'll be hypoxic to a degree, usually with an SpO2 number below what they would normally be at when they weren't having an asthma attack. They may or may not be using accessory muscles to breathe. And what this means is if you lifted up the shirt or looked at the muscles on the neck or the chest, you would see them retracting or pulling into the chest in order to enlist additional muscular support or strength to take a full and complete deep breath. This is considered a very concerning thing to see. And if you're caring for a patient who's using accessory muscles to breathe, you need to begin treatment as soon as you can. Finally, a characteristic of asthma here, which is fairly unique to the condition, is the presence of a shark fin waveform on the capnogram. Now, if you remember, the normal capnography waveform resembles the shape of a box or rectangle. For a patient suffering an acute asthma exacerbation, the respiratory phase is elongated or blunted, creating what appears to look like a shark fin on the capnogram. As the asthma event continues or worsens, the capnogram takes a much sharper appearance. Eventually, through treatment of the asthma, the capnogram will return to the normal shape that it's supposed to be. Now, the treatment list provided here is fairly long, and generally speaking, you will not need to use all of these medications in treatment of most asthmatic patients. Treatment of an asthmatic patient involves the optimization of oxygenation and ventilation and the prevention of a secondary asthma event. We will provide our patients with high flow oxygen and provide nebulized albuterol. Albuterol is an inhaled beta-2 agonist designed to relieve the bronchoconstriction or bronchospasm and promote gas exchange and normal airflow within the small airways of the lungs. In addition to the albuterol, we may also administer atrovent or ipertropium bromide. Ipertropium bromide is a short-acting muscarinic antagonist, which is a type of anticholinergic. This medication doesn't do well on its own and should be mixed in combination with albuterol. Ipertropium bromide is designed to dry the secretions associated with some asthma events. This medication is more beneficial in adult patients and pediatric patients who have a diagnosis of asthma. The next medication to consider providing for the patient is magnesium sulfate, which is a favorite of mine. Magnesium sulfate is administered IV, 
and it works by blocking the calcium channels in the smooth muscles of the airway, which promotes bronchodilation and reduces airway excitability. Magnesium sulfate should not be used unless albuterol and ipratropium bromide, or simply albuterol, has been used as well. Depending on your patient, it may also be appropriate to administer IV fluids. And this is because tachypnea will actually make the patient slightly dehydrated. During the normal process of breathing, we exhale water vapor with each breath. And a patient who's been tachypnic for hours is far more likely to be slightly hypovolemic as a result of this hard breathing and this blowing off of water vapor. IV fluid should be cautiously used though in patients who you suspect have a history of CHF. The next medications that we'll administer to this patient are corticosteroids. Corticosteroids like dexamethasone or methylprednisolone are useful in preventing the effects of a secondary asthma event many hours later that would be refractory to albuterol or would be more difficult to treat with albuterol. These medications do not work immediately and usually have an onset of action several hours after administration. Occasionally an asthmatic may benefit from the use or application of BiPAP or CPAP to prevent atelectasis and to promote bronchodilation and reduce the effects of bronchospasm. Use this cautiously, however, in pediatric patients and those with a history of emphysema as their lung tissue may be fragile and they would be more likely to suffer a pneumothorax as a result of the application of CPAP or BiPAP. Finally, the last medication here, and it should be noted that this medication should be used absolutely last and as a last resort measure, is epinephrine 1 to 1000, given either subcutaneously or intramuscularly. We recommend not starting with this medication as it can be very taxing to the hearts of older patients. So save this one for last your patient is refractory to everything else. Now albuterol, be aware, can be given multiple times. There's no theoretical maximum dose of albuterol, especially in the pre-hospital environment, but the risk to administering too much albuterol is causing hypokalemia. Hypertropium bromide is generally given a, a maximum three times. Magnesium can be given in one to four gram boluses, but generally it's given once. And corticosteroids are only given once as the effects will not be seen for several hours after administration. All right, and that's the quick rundown on asthma. Thank you for watching Paramedic Patho Fizz. Please remember to like and subscribe for more videos and leave me a comment below on suggestions for future videos and what you'd like to see me do differently. Until I see you next time, stay safe and keep washing your hands.